I drink your milkshake. You are listening to the Billionaire Podcast Network. Okay, go. Welcome, everyone. Oh, my God. I got two Zins in. Sorry. Whew. Oh. Welcome, everybody, to uh, Lost in the Maze number 14. Lost in the Maze is the solo show here only on the Billionaire Podcast Network. Ka-ching! Ming, 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 ming. Dick to D. Fill her up. Uh, this is the... Oh, God, these ends are killing me. I'm sorry. Oh, I should not have put these in before uh, before I hit the record button. Good God. I don't know why anyone does these things. I keep doing them, and they just hurt, and they make it hard to talk. And I'm just, I'm just salivating like crazy. I never had this issue with snus. Never had this issue with real tobacco. Uh, I, I used to... I used to dip um, the. <laughs> I used to dip the uh, the general brand snus 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 Swedish. So I think it's snus pouches, and that has that's real tobacco in the pouch, and those were delightful. Those were divine. Um, they, they just had such a wonderful tobacco flavor. And you didn't have to worry about spitting, like with moist snuff, like Col- Skoll or Copenhagen. Um, and the, yeah, they were they were just always like really pleasant, gave you a nice buzz, very relaxing. Cut, came in great flavors, you know, original white, mint, uh, extra white, I don't know. Um, and I did those forever. And then you know, I just stopped seeing them around. And um, you, I think a lot of places you can still get the camel, snus, snus, snus. But those are, those are terrible. First off, the, the shape of the pouch uh, does not feel good in your mouth. It, it's a more elongated pouch. And it, 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 it's unpleasant in your... Uh, you're supposed to put them... The pouches go in your upper lip. And it just, it just doesn't feel right, the camel pouch. And they, they it's like those are too sweet like they dunk them in sugar or something and they're they're just not good uh it's it's like they're they're they tried to americanize snus and it was like all right well what what do what does the american tobacco palate want in these pouches i i guess sugar i i you know even with even with tobacco products they're gonna want they're gonna want it dunked in fucking sugar uh so those those were always terrible and then, the, you know, there's like a, uh, I think there's a Grizzly brand of pouches that are truly disgusting. Uh, just vile, awful things that um, are like more more in line with snuff than snus. Like they're wet and, and really strong and just ooze uh, wet tobacco into your mouth. And they, they just do not 
taste good at all. And, and the Swedes figured it out with their snus. We, we, you know, whether it's General or what's the other one? Goatsburg Rape, <laughs> I think it's called. There's tons of different brands. And I did those forever. Uh, and then you just couldn't find them anymore. And then I and then I got like I then I got really into uh, vaping, and uh, vaping vaping's fun. I you know I like it. I like be I like waking up and first thing in the morning scrambling to find the vape in my bed, just tossing and turning, flipping the sheets everywhere, turning the mattress over, trying to find out where this fucking thing went, digging up under the bed looking for it. And then moving away the cobwebs and dust and pennies and candy canes to uh, to secure my vape, and and then blowing all the all the gunk off of it, so that I can get that get that f- nice fresh hit in the morning. The only good one. That's the thing, folks, about smoking, vaping, dipping, whatever it is. Uh, it, when you've been doing it for a little while, the the first one of the day is the only good one, and it's the only one that gives you any sort of buzz any sort of like real feeling of anything and then the rest of the day you're just chasing that high and it's always just out of reach never to be found again and and then the um you know the four to eight hours you're asleep during the night sort of resets the clock on all that and then yeah and then it's that first one of the morning that actually feels kind of good but it's it's an awful miserable uh Sisyphusian habit, I would say, um, that you, you're just constantly uh, the the proverbial boulder in this instance would be uh, the um, I, I guess this the the high that you feel from nicotine itself, but it's never it's never to be found. It's never to be as good as the very very first time you try it, which is an equal measure of. Uh, you know pleasantness and it, sickness where it's like oh this feels kind of nice and then you throw up uh and then every time after that you get you know you get more and more accustomed to it and then you settle into this routine of first one of the day feels good everyone after that is lacking and only creates a deeper desire and want for that first that first of the day feeling um but the zins especially you know it's it, it's the same thing where it's like the first one of the day is the only one that produces any sort of like pleasant feeling but everyone from the first one to the last one of the day just hurts and is like really unpleasant it makes me sneeze it burns my throat um just makes my mouth water and, and i have trouble like I, I i like i lose the ability to even talk because there's so much just stuff in my mouth and so right right before I hit record on this one, I popped in a couple Zen Wintergreens, six milligram. And God, it's just bur- it's just burning my throat and my chest. It's crazy that these have like taken off on the internet because they fucking suck. Like at, at the end of the day, it, it's you know, they're, they're just a um hollow facsimile of the thing I really want, which is actual tobacco. And it's not even like I'm using them um out of, out of some necessity to uh abstain from tobacco itself it's just that i can't find the actual tobacco product that i want which are the uh tobacco pouches i can get um i can get snuff i can get chew but i don't want to deal with all that spitting i grew up with that shit and it's disgusting and it, it's it's such a it's a pain in the ass and I don't, I don't know like why it's so prevalent in the south and in sports and with dudes um but yeah because because all that spitting is just a nuisance and it's really really gross i mean i remember when i was a kid my brother when i still would see him every now and then uh he's very estranged now but when i was when i was a kid my brother dipped a lot and i remember going over to his uh I think he had a trailer at the time he's like much older than me he's like 10 years older than me so i was really young and he was an adult and he had his own trailer uh, we went there and i didn't know any better i didn't know that you're no matter what <clears throat> you're not supposed to just drink loose strange beverages and so i saw a pepsi sitting on the counter and you know we all know how big a fan of pepsi i am i, I go pepsi over coke these days 
And so I got I got really excited. I said, "Oh, a Pepsi! I love I love the refreshing, youthful uh, flavor of Pepsi." Um, and so I cracked that open and took a big swig of it, ready to taste the, the to to feel the 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 sweet, refreshing rush uh, of a Pepsi. And what I got instead was, was um, the sickness and disease of warm uh, tobacco spit. He had been using that Pepsi bottle as a spitter and it was full up with spit, which I've never seen before or since. I've never seen anyone could fill a bottle to the brim where it just looked like a full Pepsi bottle like that. Um, but he did it and I took a big old swig and just immediately got very, very sick. It burned, it, it hurt, it, it made me, uh, I had to go spit it out in the sink and then I ran outside and threw up. And that would not be the last time that I was betrayed by my dear brother. Uh, for in those days, he was quite the um, ne'er-do-well and would, um, you know, I, I think, well, I think at that point he was softening up. Uh, but I remember many times, the, the times that he, he would come around, uh, for sure he was a, a, a bully of sorts. I remember being chased around with, he, he, would, he would keep pet snakes. So he would chase me around with snakes. Um, he would hold me at knife point every now and then. Uh, he had he had some gun. It was like one of those wooden guns that shot ping pong balls. And he would just peg me with ping pong balls all the time. And that would sting. Um, and, you know, I, re I remember one time. Uh, yeah, there was there was one time my dad drove like drove us. He, he was going to the bank or something. And we were in his Ford Ranger. And uh, he, he parked outside. And my dad went and said, you know, you boys wait in the truck here. And he went inside into the bank. And then my brother uh, pulled out a big old, a big ass pocket knife out of his pocket and flicked it open and then just held me at knife point against, like I'm pressed against the, I was pressed against the door of the truck while he's like threatening to stab me, uh, which he didn't. I think he was just trying to uh, pester me to, to instill the, uh, the fear that an older brother is, is want to instill in a, in a younger sibling uh but that that was terrifying and so we never we never really had a good relationship my brother and i and then uh when he became an adult uh this, you know he turned 18 it was a he had gotten his ged and this was around the time of 9 11 uh so he was feeling very uh excuse me oh man I just drank a Coke as well, a fully leaded, full sugar Coke, which I regret because I washed it down with a uh, Starbucks double shot caramel uh, can. And I know we're supposed to be boycotting Starbucks right now for some reason, uh, but I don't uh, care. Uh, so I just went ahead and bought the uh, the double, the big uh, tall boy 16 ounce double shot caramel can of whatever that was. So I washed down my Coca-Cola with that, and then I washed that down with a cool blue Gatorade. Uh, and now I'm drinking a black, this was an iced coffee, is a Maxwell House K-Cup um, that they let me use it here in the lobby of the Days Inn because you know I'm still homeless. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a Maxwell House K-Cup that I brewed over ice. The ice has melted. Now I'm drinking that. I got two Zins in, and I will be shitting my britches momentarily after the, the concoction that I have funneled into my gut. Uh, but for right now, we're podcasting. But he, so my brother was 18, and 9-11 and had just happened. Toby and Toby Keith was uh, in the laboratory working on the uh, the seminal record, Shock and Y'all, which, which was, re you know, getting ready to inspire all of us to uh, thirst for the blood of Arabs. <clears throat> and he, uh, so he enlisted in the army uh, right around that time. And, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of dumb or rather he, he does not possess any sort of like book or computer smarts. I wouldn't say he's dumb. Like he, he definitely is, is like a uh, smart guy in his own right. 
like he, he possesses a lot of common sense and, and uh like tangible useful knowledge and, and uh instinct but he doesn't have what i have you know he could i i, I guarantee he couldn't do what i'm doing right now um but he, he enlisted in the army and joined the infantry and was was he was ready and willing he was re- he put his life on the line and uh went over there to gun down uh iraqis as part of o- operation iraqi freedom um when we invaded a country that had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11 uh but he was he was very devoted to the United States military, to the armed forces, the service, and uh, fought and worked his way through infantry, became a paratrooper for the, uh, I believe it was the 82nd Airborne, the same division as my dad when he fought in uh, the first Gulf War, Desert Shield. And then um, our dad, forgive me, feels weird to say that because I don't have a fucking relationship with him at all. Um, and then, so he was a paratrooper, and then he went to, like, SEER training, which is, uh, what is it? I forget what it means. Not SEERS, like the department store that, that has uh, gone bankrupt, but it's S-E-R-E. Let me look that up. It's Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. So he went to SEER training. And I remember he was telling us about seer training at one point. He said, you know, they would beat they would beat you up and, and like break a little finger here and there to to get you used to pain. They would do like they would do like John McCain uh level uh like Vietnamese POW John McCain torture on you. Uh to, to I I guess like harden you in, in case you ever became a POW yourself. And he was telling us like at one point they like buried him in a box or something like they buried him and played the sound of a baby crying for several hours so they're doing like essentially i guess like what seer training is is they do like abu Ghraib torture on you uh as a soldier so that in the event that you were captured by the enemy by any insurgents that you are prepared for what they're going to put you through and he was never captured so kind of a waste if you ask me like if i if i go through all that training like if i go through seer training and i'm dealing with all this bullshit that they're putting me through it's like i better get fu- i better become a fucking pow and and actually be, be able to utilize this shit and then get a fucking pay day from the united states government um which they're not going to do anyway the government doesn't give a fuck about its veterans no matter what um which is like which is really funny it's like the, the 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 i guess like the the fear or or whatever of the military right now is that less and fewer and fewer uh young men are enlisting and it's like yeah look at your track record you you like finagle these people and, and pitch them this like idea of serving their country and then they'll be rewarded for that in some way whether it's like free college or, or some sort of benefits or something. And the best they get when they get out is like 10% off their dinner at Applebee's if they're still in their greens, you know, after drill duty, um, which is embarrassing anyway. I don't, I've never met a single soldier with any self-respect that actually enjoys the, the uh, feeling of going to an Applebee's or a Chili's or an Outback Steakhouse while they're still in their greens and having numerous strangers come up to them and say saying thank you for your service and and then the 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 obligation of the restaurant itself to offer them some sort of discount on their meal not even a comp fucking meal like 10 to 15 maybe 20 percent off at the fucking cheesecake factory so it's like oh my my chicken diane cost 25 dollars instead of 30 dollars we're eating good tonight family um that's the best they get the va itself uh doesn't give a fuck about them to the point where they're like talking about now like stripping away even more benefits for these people and so they they wonder why like nobody wants to enlist i was just talking to a friend of mine uh it was was so funny because like nobody calls me anymore like ever, ever since my brain accident and like 
the way I treated everyone and just fell off the map. Uh, nobody really calls me anymore. Um, and so I got a phone call the other night from a number I just did not recognize. And it wasn't, it wasn't even a, re a regular phone call. It was a FaceTime, which it, for a lot of people is psychotic. And I get it. Uh, FaceTime is a reviled technology amongst at least Caucasians. Uh, blacks and Hispanics love to do FaceTime at full volume in public. Uh, but uh, Whitey is not a big fan of FaceTime. Uh, not even a fan of phone calls, the white, the whitey. Um, you know, texting is, is usually the way we go. Um, and even then, you know, it's it's hours, days after the text was sent. But so I got but I got this uh FaceTime call from a number I didn't recognize. And so I answered it, and um it was an old friend of mine from high school who is in the military. He enlisted right after high school um, in the Marines, and now he's, he's in the Army working as a recruiter. And I'm glad I answered it because, it, you know, this is a guy I really love and care about, and we just haven't spoken in a long time. And um, he just he wanted to check in because he knew that, like, something terrible had happened to me, and he, he saw, uh, you know, he saw me starting to post more and more on TikTok, and he said he was enjoying it all, <laughs> so he wanted to check in. And he was telling me that uh, he he lives in like kind of a ritzier area uh, where he lives now. I'm not going to dox him. I'm not going to say where it is, but he he's um, working as an army recruiter. And but a lot of the kids that at these schools that he goes to and tries to uh, get to enlist are like, you know, like rich. They they come from like wealthier, well-to-do families. And so he was telling me, he was telling me that like a lot of these parents just tell him to fuck right off for for trying to do this. And I was like, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't blame them. Rich kids uh, don't join the military. That's not for rich kids. Uh, it's it's for poor people and maybe like lower middle class. It, it's for uh, children who uh, truly do, cannot think of any other way to get by in this life. And hey, it worked out for him, you know. It's, it's I'm the idiot like I went to college and my, my life is in fucking shambles and, and now he's you know he's an army recruiter got a wife two kids nice house a mustache uh, and he's, he's doing very well he said he wants to uh, to come on the podcast which I would be more than happy to have him on uh, because I think it's far more interesting to talk to people on podcasts that actually do stuff instead of just the same re revolving door of fucking comedians with the, the same stories and, and shop talk that everyone hears i mean jesus fucking christ could you think of anything more boring at this point let's get serious here come, come here come with me on this could you think of anything more uh, brutal and boring than listening listening to wealthy comedians talk about the fucking craft of stand-up comedy i mean jesus fucking christ not only is it unrelatable it's absolutely fucking boring nobody cares nobody gives a shit about how you come up with your fucking skits and bits it, it's one of the most banal trite awful self-indulgent narcissistic conversations that has become the crux of this medium of podcasting and I, I find it truly revolting, the, the number of people who have achieved great success, who do these shows, shows that presumably make money hand over fucking fist in every single episode, every conversation they have, it, it, at some point, it involves a lengthy discussion about the process, about the craft of how to be a fucking dipshit clown for a living. It's so goddamn boring and, and just like completely unrelatable to most people listening. Most people listening are in a car on their way to some like terrible dead end fucking office job, and they just they want to hear actual skits and bits. They don't want to hear they don't want to hear the the fucking sausage factory in in which the the proverbial sausage itself is made. No, nobody wants to hear that. So I think it would be much more interesting uh if this 
you know, as the Billionaire Podcast Network, a ching bing 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 ding ding filler up continues, uh, it would be more interesting to talk to people who actually uh, do stuff and contribute something in some way beyond uh, jotting down the word anal and foreskin on a cocktail napkin, uh, which I think is the process for a lot of people because comedians are extraordinarily lazy. And I, you know, I am the laziest of them all. Uh, I hate actually doing shit, but, and I'm also, but I'm also not a comedian anymore. I'm the first billionaire podcaster, the Daniel Plainview of podcasting, the uh, Beelzebub of boobies. Um, and so I'm, I'm out of all of that uh, for now. I mean, people keep asking me, like, are you going to get back into stand up? And it's like, I mean, yeah, I guess at some point, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm like rebuilding a, a broken existence and just trying to uh fix you know everything that fell that fell fucking apart um you know people reach out and they say you know oh you were the funniest of the the loud boys and it's like yeah i know that's why the show just was not working because i was you know comedians are narcissists and self-involved and so if if there's one person in a group that threatens the dynamic that is uh sociopathy and narcissism of being a comedian then it's going to cause problems and tension so it's like you know the show the show itself i think people enjoyed but i've talked about this before but i mean off mic or even even a lot of times on mic i mean you, you know there, there was so much tension between us and um what was never said or talked about or admitted was the fact that like at that time i was the one that was sort of the the focal point of of that program uh and it's it's like i mean sorry guys i mean you know the, but the, i mean the thing is is like you know i love robbie um uh, joe you know uh i'm sure he's doing okay but it's like it, you know you know when you get down when you get right down to it at the end of the day it's like both of those guys lives then and now we're, we're always just much better than mine anyway and it, it, it but it was like in this weird high school popularity click environment uh, of being in a comedy scene what and i mean what a fun thing right you know to be an adult and, and really want to be part of of a fucking scene uh you know that's what that's what every adult needs is to to still just try and recreate the high school experience that they wish they could have had um but within that uh yeah it, it just was causing problems that finally for for the first time in my life uh but there were people that liked me and, and were drawn to what i was doing and had to say and it was just causing so much problems because you know um i think you know i think robbie's a good dude and he has a good heart but he he certainly does care a lot about his image and how he appears to people and really wants to be famous and so i think it was like bothering him that he was not the uh quote unquote star of the show and then i think you know i think with joe it was like this situation where i think it was a situation where he was being exposed as maybe not as cool as he wanted everyone to think he was or is uh, and it's like well i don't does anyone think you're cool i mean you're just short and ugly so it's i mean it's pretty obvious that like this shtick you're doing um, you know, I don't know how many people listening know what I'm talking about. Like, I, I don't know how many people came over to this from that and how many people are like new to me and what I do, but you know, we were a cast of characters. Um, and, and it was like, I think people were drawn to me because I was for better or worse and de certainly worse. <laughs> I was more of an open book and willing to be like very, uh, funny and, and riff a lot but also sincere and, and open in who i am and then um my cohort at the time joe just would not have any of that like he really was is very guarded and wanted everyone to think that he's the coolest person in the room and then you know and then robbie wants to be a uh, very famous and so that i you know the value our values just weren't lining up and i was like slowly just uh, diving into insanity uh, unbeknownst to me um 
and so that's you know that's why everything fell apart i guess but you know people still reach out and tell me you know you, you're still the, the funniest of the loud boys which is nice to hear i mean I, you know i wish i had any success or money or um anything really good happening in my life but you know we we build back we build back better dark brandon style or whoever said that whoever came up with build back was it elizabeth warren that came up with build back better triple b um i don't know uh but you know life goes on uh and, and we, we we do what we can folks uh anyway henry kissinger died and uh you know my uh my thing is is i i am only vaguely aware that he he was a guy who did things uh a lot of which were i guess bad but i i, I have no clue what he actually did um i know that a lot of lefties a lot of leftists which i suppose i would maybe i fall into that camp uh condemn him and we're happy to see him die um and i you know I, i'm happy to see anyone really really old die it's like beat it geezer your time your time has come and gone it's over get the fuck out of here we should do midsummer rules we should do like logan's run midsummer uh where it's like once you hit a certain age bye bye you're jumping off the cliff like like that cult in midsummer 72 years old it's time to take a plunge okay and then if you don't die from that we beat you over the head with a sledgehammer peter gabriel style um but he, yeah Hen henry kissinger died and i like i've only heard bits and pieces over the years that he was a kind of a bad guy but it's all mixed because like there's you know he he's such a he was such a part of the system and so integral in like whatever the american empire is that he's also very respected and, and uh looked upon as, as with almost a sense of nobility um and at the end of the day i don't have a fucking clue what he did uh people say he was a monster truly evil one, one of the most vile awful things to ever happen to america in the world and uh i know i could i could research this i could look it up but I ain't doing homework, folks. Okay, I'm not reading a goddamn thing. I'm not watching a YouTube video essay. I'll take your word for it. I guess he sucked. Uh, I guess he was also good, depending on which news channel you watch. But um, at the end of the day, I don't have any hard and fast opinions on him. I just know he, he was an old Jewish man who uh, looked very funny at the end of his life. He, he looked like, like Jewish Dr. Robotnik. You know, he, he had a very huge, like, portly belly. Uh, and he it looked like he was, like, sinking into his own stomach. His own torso, almost. Um, and then, you know, and then he died at, at the age of 100. So he's the victor. He What a victory. Uh, we should all be so lucky to live to 100. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I know he had, he had something to do with Cambodia vietnam i don't know the petrol dollar i mean if, if anyone wants to hop in the comments and, and correct me on or not correct me because i'm openly admitting i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about i just don't feel really one way or the other about it because all all this shit's exhausting like when people start talking about like the when people use the words the american empire i'm checked out it's like nope i know i know that it's it, like a lot of the america does a lot of bad things I understand that. I understand it's it's corrupt and messed up or whatever, uh, but not there's nothing I can do about it. And I could talk till I'm blue in the face on this and bitch and moan and complain. And hey, maybe even create a nice, comfortable life for myself as a sort of uh, political commentator, reactionary grifter. If I was more, just a little bit more knowledgeable and more passionate about what these things are. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I do not really care. I got too, I got too much, uh, other stuff going on in my life. And so whenever I hear the words American empire, it's I'm out, I'm out brother. We're not having that conversation. That's, that's, that's why it's, it's tough to be online these days. Cause there, there's so many people who 
uh, really give a shit about this stuff. And, you know, I guess it's good to care about things, but so- sort your own fucking life out before you start trying to tackle the, uh, you know, these these ge- these heavy geopolitical issues. Because um, that's all you can do, you know? We only have control over ourselves and our own lives. And we know voting doesn't work. Uh, we know that that's a scam. That's a charade, a ruse. And so all we can do is just try and figure out some way to become uh, upwardly mobile in our own lives and fight the Matrix. <laughs> Andrew Tate style, folks. Because, um, I, I mean, yeah, what, what can anyone really do? It's like, it's like I, I'll, I'll listen to these podcasts every now and then or pay attention to these sort of like political commentators whether it's like Chapo or shapiro or like but either side of the aisle or whatever and it's like just you're just bloviating blowhards but you're not actually fucking doing anything like none of these people are doing any real tangible work they're just like doing what i'm doing now which is talking into a microphone and praying that this works well enough and long enough that they don't have to work real jobs because truly that's the like that's what we want like more than anything i think anyone's motivation for doing anything uh when when it comes to saying things uh it, on the internet or in public or to other people is is a deep desire to not actually have to work too hard and, and also make a lot of money doing it uh because <clears throat> working hard really gets you nowhere i mean you know think about it you you, you you get i'm stuttering now i can't even fucking talk you get a job like you get a job wherever like i work a day job and they tell you like they, they give you this rubric this like um road map for what the job entails and they tell you you know after this many years you could start making six like six figures which is nothing to sneeze at, isn't it? Like that's that's a decent amount of money, but then you start like really thinking about it. And you go, okay, so I worked this this bullshit job for a number of years, for in the hopes of for the potentially, for the potential to possibly at some point maybe sort of kind of make low six figures, a hundred thousand dollars a year at some point. And like to thinking about that and the amount of time and work, like the investment of your time and energy and just emo- emotional well-being, psychic well-being that goes into that to ev- like finally start scraping the bottom of six figures. Like, well, that's peanuts. That's fucking nothing. It's 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 a decent salary for like certain parts of the United States. I mean, I would fucking suck a dick for that right now, for sure. But in the grand scheme of things, that is maybe lower middle class uh, for the most part uh, in this economy. Yeah, it's it's like nothing. And so like when you're working a real job and you're looking down the barrel of like, f- you know, five to 10 years to at some point maybe get that kind of money. It's like, oh my, God, this is just so crushed. I, I just feel like I'm caught in the gears of some malevolent machine. One I must rage against perhaps. And, and so and so I think every I think everybody when they're faced with that when they're faced like with, with the reality of what the working world is and what oh forgive me for saying this word capitalism demands of us it, it's it's like we're we're all we all feel this like desire within us to escape that somehow so I think more than uh, a ceasefire or world peace or blah 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 any of the you know ukraine russia um fossil fuels climate like more than that i think what each person really really wants more than anything is to make a lot of money without having to do too much work that's the that's what we re- uh, the, the, here's the thing i'm gonna like this is an honest show that's my angle is rather than have any sort of like grift or commentary or re, like be a reactionary as, as I am, uh, like not, I'm not trying to be a reactionary. You know what I mean? I'm trying to be honest. I'm saying that my motivations for doing this, and I think everyone's motivations that do anything really 
are to uh, secure the bag without having to work really, really hard to do it. Um, because even people, you know, people in this in podcasting or comedy, entertainment, whatever, they'll say they're working hard. They'll make these claims like, I worked really hard to get here. And it's like, did you really? Or like, I mean, re- it, w- w- what is work in, in this regard? Like talking into a microphone a few times a week? That's, yeah, that's really, really hard backbreaking labor. And I, I can understand the value of it. Not everyone can do this. Not everyone's good at it. Broadcasting is a specialized talent. Uh, and, and I'm certainly grateful that, you know, I can do this and not everyone can't. Therefore, it has value. You know, even even in the, the over, it's such an oversaturated market as it is. But within that, the, you know, the cream always rises to the top. And so there's there's not a lot of fucking people that can do what I'm doing right now. I'll tell you that goddamn much. And, and so that's kind of what I'm banking on. But I would say, but that's for everybody. Everybody wants to break free of the grind. And, and so I think that's what every, you know, I, I think when you get right down to it, that's what everyone's motivations are for anything. And you can hear it in their voice. You can always hear it in in their voice, uh, whatever they're it, like, whatever they're doing. Um, and I, I think I think that certain people have convinced themselves that the, that what they're doing is like some sort of like righteous endeavor, that they are genuinely trying to change the world for the better. But they they they're, they're so caught up in, in like the the charade of it all. That they've lost sight of the fact that what they what they're really doing, what they want, and what they've achieved is substantial wealth without actually having to work a real job. Because I hear it, I hear it when I listen to anyone like like Ben Shapiro or Tucker Carlson, even Chapo, whomever it may be, I can hear it in their voice that this this like the equal parts like passion, but also fear and anxiety and, and uh, nervousness that uh that this could that you know trying to make trying to get this to keep working you know what i mean because i think they know deep down somewhere within them that what they're doing is bullshit and they have gotten away with a grand heist that they they have been able to maneuver around the like what society has asked of anyone which is to work a real job and provide some value for something. And, and you know, and, and so they've worked around that and have achieved like a level of wealth and success that is just completely out of reach and unaccessible to many. And they, they know that they're frauds. They know that what they're doing is, is in some way fraudulent. And I know that, but the thing is, I know that what I'm doing right now is fraudulent. And the thing is, I'm just not making any money right now. I mean, I am the first billionaire podcaster, the Daniel Plainview of podcasting, the Beals above a boobies here on the Billionaire Podcast Network. Ka-ching, bing, 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 did fill her up. But I'm always willing to admit that this is a completely fraudulent endeavor, uh, a con job. I'm a con artist. Um, it, it's just an open and honest discussion uh, about that thing, you know, about what it is. Um but these people have deluded themselves into thinking that they're not. And so, and so you can just hear the, the, like how disingenuous it is um, with a lot of these people. And, you know, there's some exceptions to the rule for sure. Like if, if I watch, uh, you know, Infowars and listen to Alex Jones, there is passion and truth in what he does. And I don't mean objective truth. I don't mean that what he's saying is necessarily true in the tangible sense i think he genuinely believes that what he says and does is the truth and that's why he's constantly in trouble and owes like billions of dollars to the families of of the sandy hook victims um because he does actually believe in what he what he does and in what he's doing uh and so you know there's always exceptions um but you know for the most part uh yeah i think i think people just don't want to have to get get crushed in the millstones of capitalism (laughs) 
and you know what i find truly disgusting and and uh, you know i you know at least with like leftist uh grifters i suppose they can acknowledge that work they at least acknowledge that working sucks and that people should not have to be made to sell their souls and their time to billion dollar corporations for uh you know peanuts and pennies whereas like the these like right wing guys these like more conservative grifters they claim to really value uh, a hard day's work and castigate and condemn people that would dare ask for more money and benefits at whatever job they're working you know there, there's all there's all this like talk now of a four-day work week and, and cutting hours and paying people more and just making life a little bit easier a little more comfortable for the average american and i remember seeing something a while back where it was like ben shapiro complaining about uh, you know he was like you know back, back in my day people worked 40 hours a week and you you made six dollars an hour and you could you feed you feed your family and you, you go to the factory and work 40 hours a week and blah 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 and it's like do, i mean <clears throat> are you are you going are you at least willing to acknowledge that you maybe work six hours a week doing what you do like i mean like his his job doesn't seem like it, it's labor intensive or necessarily difficult he just fires up the camera and, and does hate speech for an hour like three or four times a week i could do that you know that doesn't seem like it's a it's a difficult position to have um but i yeah i i that that's where i i find it truly disgusting i mean at least admit and appreciate the fact that you're a fraud and you manage to uh escape what the what the rest of the world has to go through which is just you know grinding away at in a true sisyphusian effort you, you, trying to survive and then you know dying mostly alone and in debt uh like when you die you know you you created generational wealth doing what you do and, and your family will be secure upon your passing but me and my family you know when my dad dies i'll have to take on his bills and then when i die my ne whoever my next of kin is i can't I, I mean, it would be nice if I could start a family at some point, but I, I would imagine that, um, realistically speaking, I'm going to die one day. Uh, that's, 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 that is certain. I, I can assure all of you, unfortunately, I will die at some point. And upon my passing, uh, my very substantial debts will then either go to my, uh, widow and children or if we're being realistic, probably an uncle or something like that, you know, and, you know, that sucks, but, uh, you know, keep calling me all you want, uh, collection agencies. You're not getting a fucking penny. Okay. Until I'm, uh, making my nut in, in, in you know, in my own life, I'm not going to fucking waste my money paying back all the, all the loans and credit cards and medical bills. Uh, until I can be sure that I actually have that money. Um, so, and, and so, you know, what will probably happen is uh, a few years from now, 10, 15 years, I'll uh, collapse due to some sort of like fat related incident uh, and then spend, let's give it 72 hours in a hospital, another medical bill, ambulance ride hospital, and, and so, like, my final um, act in this world will be accumulating more debt. Uh, and then and then after that 72 hours is done, I pass, you know, I die from whatever uh, fat-related thing happened to me. And then that debt, plus all the other delinquent debts, are passed on to either an uncle or an aunt or, you know, whoever, whoever the next of kin is. Like, go, go down the line and just figure out who's still alive and who is closest to me on the uh, family tree. And then, you know, I'll be judged accordingly in the afterlife for uh, having lived such a dishonorable life, uh, devoid of virtue and truth. One in which I uh, lie, cheated, cheated stole, 
uh, and never paid back my debts. Kind of the opposite of a uh, a Lannister from Game of Thrones. You know, the Lannisters always pay their debts. Uh, the Pruitts uh, just do keep dodging phone calls. Um, and uh, I certainly do. I mean, I, nobody nobody real calls me anyway, so I just ignore everything because if it's not if it's not a collections agency, it, it's a telemarketer, it's some sort of robocall. So I just like have trained myself like instinctually now just ignore everything. Um, and the only reason I didn't ignore that phone call the other night was because it was a FaceTime, and I was like, well, collections agencies and telemarketers have never FaceTimed before, so. If it is one of them, this should at least be interesting, but I don't think it is. And fortunately, it was just an old friend and we had a good time catching up. You know, he was pretty drunk, uh, but it was fun. It was good to talk to him. His actually the, the, the guy who called, it was, you know, it was kind of brought back a lot of memories because like he and I went to high school together and we were both really good friends with uh, my friend who passed away a few years back and my the my friend who died uh he w was the first person who took me to like a high school party and it was at this friend's house the guy called me and when we got there i had seen or heard of drinks where people drop a shot of something into something else but i was not aware of what a jaeger bomb was what it entailed uh I didn't know it was Jägermeister and Red Bull. And so when we got there, uh, I saw that they had Jaeger and I said, oh, cool, I'm going to make myself a Jaeger bomb. And so I poured a shot of Jaeger and dropped it into a pint of Keystone Light. And, every, and everybody's just laughing at me. And I'm like, what? And they were like, no, go ahead. And have, you know, enjoy your drink. Enjoy your little cocktail there. And so I chugged whatever, whatever this would be called, I, I guess, uh, a, ja a dirty Jaeger bomb, a Jaeger IED, maybe. And uh, at the, you know, this being my, this was, and by the, this was like my first time ever just actually getting drunk. This is like the first time I've ever had like unfettered access to alcohol. So it's not like me sneaking sips of like Doc Otis. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers Doc Otis. It was like a proto smearing off ice, like a proto Mike's Hard Lemonade. Uh, it was like some sort of like lim boozy lemonade thing. My grandma would drink them. And so I think my only experience with alcohol up till that point was sneaking sips of my grandmother's Doc Otis uh, when she wasn't looking. Um, but th so this was the first time I ever actually was able to get drunk, like just drink whatever I wanted that was around. So I poured me a, a Jaeger IED, I guess we'll call it and uh jaeger and a pint of keystone light chugged that i thought it was delicious and then i drank about like six more of those um and and then blacked out and woke up uh in the morning at a different house uh, at some point i had made it back to my house uh my parents house you know i was living there because i was a teenager um and i woke up and went into the living room and there was my friend who is now unfortunately passed away and i said hey uh what's going on why when did we come back here what happened and he said oh wait really you know you have no clue what happened and i and also i was naked and there was no bed there were no bed sheets on my bed so i woke up on a bare mattress naked uh and just ran into the living room with my little pud uh sunken into my body cavity balls cinched up uh so it, it looked like i'd been in some sort of a industrial accident some ge like genital industrial accident uh but that's you know that's just what a fat guy's uh penis and testicles look like on on a uh, a brisk fall morning after a night of drinking and uh i asked him you know what i you know i got my hands over him and i'm like what happened and he told me, yeah, you kept drinking those, that like weird cocktail you were making, that, like whatever that was. And then you uh, started saying like a lot of like weird sexual stuff to every woman there. And so I, I, he said, I had to like get you out of there because there were, there were guys that there were fathers and husbands there that were ready to uh, beat you to the ground. And he said, uh, and then we, I, I walked you outside 
and you said, hey, I, I got to pee. And, and then you told me, okay, uh, you know, I said to you, well, yeah, go ahead, go pee. And then you um, you just said, oh, oh never mind, I'm good. And he told me, yeah, you, uh, and so you just pissed your pants right there. And then we got in your car. Uh, I was dri- I was going to drive your car because I was a little drunk, but not too drunk. So still sober enough to drive. And he told me, uh, and then you threw up everywhere, all on the inside of your car. So I, um, I, but don't worry, I went ahead and armor all all that. So that's clean. Uh, but when we got back here, uh, we, I, I stripped you down so you wouldn't get vomit all over your bed. Uh, but then you threw up in your bed anyway. So then I had to pull your sheets off the bed and throw them in the wash. Uh, they should be in the dryer now. Um, and he, he said, uh, but that, you know, pretty good first outing for, for getting drunk, right? Uh, and then we would just do that many, many more times uh, over the course of uh, our our senior year of high school and then even into our college years when we would r- go back home and visit. Um Cause there, you know, there was really nothing to do in that town except get that drunk. That was kind of the sole activity that we had was securing many, many cases, dirty thirties, if you will, of key thirty packs of Keystone Light, and just drinking as much as possible, uh, and then blacking out, and then laughing about it the next morning from whoever could remember what happened, re- regaling us with the tales of uh what each you know what what one of us did and it was usually me usually i was the one who blacked out and just completely made an ass of myself uh and then we would just all be you know and then our our friend's mom would make breakfast and then we'd be sitting around the breakfast table and everybody would be laughing at you know how i uh at some point lost my pants and then pissed all over a dog or something you know something like that um but they hey you know that's 17 for you uh and, and then nothing and then i would never do anything to humiliate or embarrass myself ever again folks <laughs> um but yeah it was it was not it was nice ca- catching up with a uh, with an old friend of mine <laughs> uh it was, it's good to see that uh, uh you know uh, uh, of everyone i went to high school with who the, the people that I was convinced were going to burn out or in some way like ruin their life, they're all actually doing pretty well. And they have houses and they get to go on nice vacations with their families once or twice a year. And I'm the one that completely fucked things up uh, and have, you know, have bankrupted myself, um, ruined the lives of other people that I love and care about and continue to do horrible, awful, evil things. Um, to myself and loved ones uh but you know that'll never stop me from podcasting i'll tell you that much uh but you know what are you gonna do speaking of uh i was just talking to um what was i because I, I i touched a, oh that's that's the thing facetiming um because I, I was just talking to somebody about this but how how funny it is that like boomers and like gen x like elder gen xers complain about younger people's relationship with technology and and the sort the sort of like idiot box sentiment that is expressed by these people uh condemning ipad babies and the the youth always having their faces in their phones and and, uh stuff like that and but they they never like notice or or take into account or admit that they are the worst about that like have you have you ever been have you ever been in a room with a boomer who has like the biggest android phone on the market uh secured in the most gaudy biggest case adorned with like like rhinestones and bedazzled jewelry and, and the the stopper thing on the back so they don't drop the phone so they don't miss another uh, play on their like slot machine app um they they are constantly on their phones and they don't observe any cell phone etiquette they might as well be uh you know puerto rican or black in the way that that, that they are just disrupting um the the peace of the public with their their cell phone usage because it's boomers and elder gen x people 
It's phone, big ass phone at full volume at all times. Every notification turned on, every ringtone, uh, and it's it's always the most obnoxious notification. It's, it's every notification is just, and then and then you're like, what the fuck was that? And they go, oh, you know, there's a, there's a new credit on my slot machine app. I gotta, I'm gonna pop outside for a cigarette to to go do some slots. It's that, and then and then they they never ignore a call. Like they 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 don't understand that. Yeah, there's tons of telemarketers and robocalls out there that just have your information, and everybody is inundated with these calls. And most of us just know to uh, a first off have the ringer turned off. It's set to either silent or vibrate. So it's not a constant uh, annoyance, nuisance, and distraction. And then when you get those calls, the the scam likely, spam risk, unknown telemarketer calls, you just press the button on the side of your phone to make it stop ringing. Press it again to end the call. Uh, but they don't do that. I've got an aunt or uh, an older rel- a cousin and some older relative. Every single one of those calls she gets, she she answers, puts it on speakerphone. And then immediately says, I fucking told you to stop calling my goddamn phone. It's like, bitch, they don't care. They don't, like, you could you, you yell at them un- until you piss your pants and, and tell them to take you off the list, whatever. The, even if they say they're going to take you off that list, they are not going to. You were going to keep getting these calls. And your only recourse, your only, like, real course of action is just to ignore them. It's, it's an unfortunate reality for sure. But it, you, what you, it serves like you're not like doing anything it serves no purpose to keep answering these fucking things and screaming into your speakerphone like a dominican at the cvs talking to his friend it's you know it's insane behavior but they all do that they're all hooked on their phones if they're not screaming at telemarketers they're they're glued to their slot machine apps or facebook which is they're the only people that still fucking use it or 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 you know watching like uh year old uh, videos that have already come and gone out of the zeitgeist or they're responding to like boomer memes uh you know on on facebook and and so they're i mean they're the ones that are like glued to this shit in the most disturbing way uh because they're the ones that were um indoctrinated by slot machines themselves you know what i mean like if, if the philosophy of like these technologies is, is we've read is that of the slot machine if, if if like a lot of these um developers are utilizing the same sort of like um the ways a slot machine will trigger those dopamine and serotonin responses in your mind the, i mean these were the first people to like experience that in a big way because it, the, their their phone scratches that itch, but what they really want, where they really would rather be, is at an Indian casino in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma, sitting in front of an actual slot machine. Because you want to talk about an iPad baby, you know, if you go to a Tex-Mex restaurant and see a kid sitting in a chair watching like Coco Melon on his iPad, it's like, yeah, this does not portend good things for sure. But you take a boomer to a, like a Choctaw casino in Durant. And, and get them in front of a slot machine there goes the next 12 hours of their life they are not fucking moving and, and they are maxing out their credit cards on this thing that that is like their one true desire is to sit in front of a like a lucky duck machine in durant oklahoma and, and just spend all of their money and go through all of their insulin uh at the casino uh, just praying and hoping that they get a bonus and the machine makes ka-ching, ka-ching noises at them. It, you know, when it turns red and says bonus, and it, it goes, ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. Uh, they live for that. And when they can't get that, the real experience, they go to the simulacra, which is the giant Android phone in the biggest OtterBox case that they clip to the uh, the thing on their belt. Uh, that has every notification turned on at full volume. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, these people just you know can't see the forest for they can't see themselves in the in the thing that they condemn, which would be uh, the youth's relationship with technology. And here's the thing: myself, my generation, and, and Zoomers and Alpha, 
like at least our relationship with technology is one in which we understand that it can make us some fucking money like we're not wasting our time looking at uh, like trump memes on facebook and, and doing uh, slot apps and, and stuff like that we're on tiktok posting every day we're po a always bbp posting okay glengarry glenn ross style on the line because if you post enough and get enough of a following that translates to money so like we at least understand that through the addiction of our phones and the way we use them and, and post things that at some point there's a chance that we could actually make real fucking money doing this and and they they don't even understand that they they, they don't even un understand the, the the power and potential of of what uh having just a smartphone can do for you because i've seen it on tiktok i've seen people on tiktok go from obscurity and poverty to having millions of followers and just completely turning their lives around and it's all because you know of this like new chinese app that has everybody addicted to it uh and so you know and so if you can secure like tv numbers of followers like one to two three four million followers then yeah you could turn that into money um and that's that's like an actual like valuable use of your time uh even though it plays into like our addiction to these things whereas they're just addicted to um nothing they're just they're just addicted to the phone itself and, and all the bright lights and, and glitter and bells and whistles that it has on it but me and my generation younger we're the fucking foot soldiers we're on the front lines of content posting okay trying to entertain trying to make some fucking money on these platforms uh because we don't want to we don't want to do what the boomers did and the gen x people did and work bullshit jobs and grow up uh you know get older and just cranky and my, mad at younger people for having like easier and comfortable lives than we did you know we want to we want to secure nice lives for ourselves and then share it with our families and younger folks and you know be uh integral parts of our communities but it starts with posting okay to to become a valued member of any community these days it starts with posting everybody okay An anyway <laughs> I hope that made sense. Uh, I, th I think I got my point across. Anyway, thank you. I love you. Bye. That's that. Uh, that was lost in the maze. Fourteen only on the Billionaire Podcast Network. Kaching! Bing, 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 bing. D to D. Fill her up.